Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Good. Uh, I think the organizers must be pretty sadistic to actually line up a professor to give a lecture right after a stand-up comedy. <laughs> well, uh, maybe the good news is I'm a professor turned out entrepreneur. Maybe I don't have my professorial skills uh, anymore. So hopefully. So here goes my story. October 1, 2016, 6.53 p.m., changed my life. So what was my life before? Life was a professor, and I used to think of myself as what I call as the combustion czar. So I set up the world's largest combustion research center in, in some ways. Um, and you're welcome to come and see it. It's actually an amazing place <coughs> at IIT Madras. Uh, we were doing very well. We were clocking a lot of funding from industry, and uh, doing a lot of research, publications, conferences, the whole works. So what happened that day was I got to watch this video for 53 minutes from 6 p.m. to 6.53 p.m. I went back and checked my email to find out like when I got that uh, email and looked at the timestamp and when I should have double-clicked it, and then looked at the, vid the video, the timing to actually come up with exactly this, because it actually changed my life. Uh, <laughs> so. This is actually a video by um, Professor Tony Seba. And um, uh, if, in case you don't know uh, who he is, he's a Stanford uh, professor and a thought leader. And this was actually prior to the time when he wrote his book about uh, transportation and energy. And this talk was about transportation and energy. While I was actually trying to set up this combustion center along with my colleagues with uh, primarily three pillars, which is automotive combustion, thermal power, and aerospace propulsion, I myself am an aerospace engineering professor doing propulsion, and there's a reason why I was doing combustion of jet engines and rockets. That sounds cool, right? Just keep, that, keep it that way. Uh, <clears throat> but at the end of that 53 minutes, basically two out of three of those pillars were actually getting knocked down. He was basically saying, we're not going to actually do combustion cars anymore <laughs> in, the, in the next, uh, let's say, 13, 14 years from at that time. And we are going to get all of the power from solar for that, and we are not going to actually burn coal anymore. And these are the two things that many of my colleagues were actually working on, for which we were putting, the, putting parts of the combustion center together. So I had a choice that evening. I spent a lot of time thinking about it till about 1 a.m., talking to my colleague, walking with him <coughs> at night at, in, in the beautiful campus that we have. Uh, his wife was actually not uh, was away. That's the reason why you could you could spare, spare his time with me that day, right? My wife doesn't care about me. <laughs> and that evening, we were basically saying two out of these three pillars are going away, and I belong to aerospace propulsion. I could jolly well continue to pretend that I can do my jet engines and rockets, and think that it's not going to actually get threatened by electrification or solar and go to my conferences and all that stuff. As it is, the conferences are actually getting very stale. So, the, so we used to go to these combustion conferences where people would actually have these titles for panel discussions. Um, is that, is the, when is the IC engine going to die? <laughs> right? So and it's like a very, very bad uh, thing to be in. So most of the people would be in denial, and it, it's actually happening even today. right? And, and of course, people have actually jumped ship. They all want to burn hydrogen some, one way or the other because they want to burn, keep burning something or the other. Um, but I thought to myself, if I were to actually live in denial for the rest of my career, uh, I'm just going to go into oblivion. So if I were to actually go into oblivion, I might as well actually raise my hand before I go into oblivion. And raising my hand was to actually go electric on planes. And so I started looking around to see uh, what, what, what happens if we actually electrify planes. So I did what all typical professors do, which is go to conferences. Now, look, looking in search of uh, panels and, and, and sessions which are on electric planes, and there weren't many. Um, they were talking about electric aviation in general. But then uh, I also did one more thing, which is if you want to learn something, you teach a course or to unsuspecting students. And, and students come in droves no matter what you teach, because they want the attendance and the grades and so on. So I did the world's first electric, a full-fledged semester-long course in electric aircraft propulsion. And I learned about all the stuff that was going on. There were a lot of startups around who were actually doing this when compared to academics who were doing this. 
And I think it's still more, still more or less the same. I was talking to an academic uh, from Carnegie Mellon the other day, um, and he was like, academics are so fossilized, they still want to do fossil fuels and, and, and IC engines. We have like a very hard time hiring people who do electric mobility. And I said, that sounds, that sounds very familiar. So this is exactly what is the situation in academia, whereas a lot of startups actually had started doing electric aircraft. When I started learning about electric aircraft, I found that we can't go too far with electric aircraft with the kind of batteries that we have. And then I had to actually start learning about what's the kind of product we can build and what's the market that we have for that. And I was getting completely disoriented because typical aircraft, even if you're taking like a Cessna four-seater, it has a huge range of about 1,600 kilometers. I don't know of anyone who has actually flown a Cessna for 1,600 kilometers. So combustion actually is an overkill. And that's the reason why we are suffering what we are suffering. Right? We just didn't understand the power of combustion. We just abused it for about 100 years. Right? And if you want to just do electric, it, it actually puts you down to exactly where you belong. Just go the distance that you, can, that, that you want to go and then be done with it. And that's what electric would do. So no matter how big the plane is, it could be a Boeing 747 or it could be a four-seater Cessna, it'll do only about 200 kilometers. And that's actually the thing about batteries. If you're using fuel, you're going to burn the fuel, the plane will get lighter so you can actually go farther. But if you have a battery, you're not even spewing electrons out. The electrons are just only ex getting exchanged. So you're not really losing weight. So you, no matter how big your plane is, you will actually go only about 200 kilometers. Question then is, what do we do with this 200 kilometers? And there are no two runways that are just about 200 kilometers apart, so there is absolutely no use case for this. And then you have to actually think about a vertical takeoff so that we can take off from rooftops without having runways and then do urban aerial mobility. And that's exactly what I do. And so we have this company called the E-Plane Company, which is into making the world's most compact two-seater electric air taxi with the idea of actually trying to induct this by late 2024, early 2025. Of course, it's going to be more like 2025 rather than the 2024, right? But I keep hoping that it'll be 2024. Um, good, good thing is, I think there is a good, good amount of government support that we can count on to make this happen, I hope, uh, sooner than later. So if we are actually going to be later, it may be us, because we have to actually develop the tech, and I don't think I should blame any of the policies or the, or the government. But I hope, so it's, it's, all a, it's all a work in progress. It's, so we are trying to build this ecosystem. We are actually beginning to talk to people about where we want to do the landing and takeoff, what should be the trajectories, what should be the optimization to make sure that we don't collide aircraft and all of those things. That's the urban aerial mobility bit. But I am busy trying to do my electric VTOL uh, aircraft. And why is it to be the most compact? We are trying to do this for the Indian market. And the Indian market, it turns out, at, at a much later stage, it's very interesting. There are some very early stage um, investors who do not bother about the market and all this stuff. If they see some cool tech, they say, OK, I want to actually get into this. And I really thank them for that, right? Well, I should name them, right, Vishesh? <laughs> Especially, right? And, 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 and uh, Naval Ravikant. So that was actually pretty good, right? So, but it's only later we could actually find that India actually is the best market suited for this based on several reports that have actually come out and more reports are coming out. So I'm actually hoping that we will be doing a very good air taxi hopefully in the next couple of years. On the way, we are just about one or two weeks away from trying to launch our subscale prototype, which, is still, which itself is actually fairly big. It's one of those biggest um, unmanned drones, if you will, but it actually is a winged drone meant for making going long distances. So we have an IP that will allow us to actually go fairly slowly, making use of the VTOL while going forward as well. This will allow us to actually do multiple short hops in a single charge, like how exactly a taxi should work. So these are things that I actually learned about how we need to develop IP for a market instead of saying, I'll make a product and then figure out whoever wants to buy that. that, is, that that's not how it, entrepreneurship is supposed to work. I'm a very, very studious guy, so I actually take everything seriously. If I actually want to get into entrepreneurship, I start learning how entrepreneurship needs to be done, and I do it. Thank you very much.